The following interview has been conducted with Kirk Cerny for the Purdue Library's Oral History Project. It took place on October 31st, 2013, and the interviewer is Sammy Morris. Kirk, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Thank, Thank you, you, Sammy. Happy <laughs> Halloween. Happy Halloween to you as well. <laughs> and for the record, it's a rainy one. It is a rainy <laughs> one, yes. People in the future may, want, may, may be interested in that. Yeah. Um, I thought we could talk talk first about your early life a little bit and um, for the record there are a few formalities that we ask you to go through like stating your full name and when and where you were born so okay. I'll have you start with that piece. Okay I'm Kirk Randall Cerny and I was born in Houston Texas. Oh another Texan like myself okay so prior to college where did you go to school? I went to elementary school at Ruth Pirtle Elementary in Lincoln Nebraska I went to junior high at Lincoln East Junior Senior High in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I finished high school at Washburn Rural High School in Topeka, Kansas. Okay. So your, your undergraduate degree is in human biology and business from University of Kansas. What attracted you to this field? I had always been intrigued by science and I was good at it. Mm -hmm. So it was a natural... Uh, progression for, for me out of high school, for example. Um, I had finished all the science courses, physics, chemistry, that were available by the end of my junior year, so I was doing independent study in science uh, during my senior year of high school, and I figured going into college, why not uh, you know, take the lowest hanging fruit and get into biology? Um, in the first week of chemistry, we covered everything that I knew about chemistry oh, wow. in college, <laughs> and and then we were on to new and and uh, greater frontiers, and um, that was the only time that I've ever been scared of science in my life uh, wow. because it it was all new and it was moving at a fast pace. But once I got my legs under me, um, I knew that that I could I could cut it in mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. and just always attracted. Well, were you thinking at that time that you would maybe want to be a science educator, or what were you more of? I was more headed toward medical school or uh -huh. toward research biology. Oh, um, when I was going into my junior year of college, my uh, advisor, who was a professor of biology by the name of Bob Hirsch uh, at the University of Kansas, called me into his office, and um, I thought I'd perhaps done something uh, wrong and he said to me Kirk you know I've watched you over the last couple of years you will be um, bored to tears as a research biologist and he says I don't even know if you have the patience to be a physician he said um, you know you're certainly free to pursue what you want to pursue but you have such an extroverted personality and so forth you know you can use you know your biology degree to do virtually anything and um, he said, but just think about it, because if you do head toward a laboratory career, you're going to be frustrated with it. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time thinking about that advice and decided that I would you know, look at other options. That next semester, we had two courses that we could take in our entire college curriculum that were elective, so six hours total. Mm -hmm. I took the first three hours in intro to broadcasting. I took the second three hours in sports broadcasting, which was a graduate level course with a fellow by the name of Tom Hedrick, who used to be a voice on ABC Sports, and he was the voice of the Cincinnati Reds and whatnot. And, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed you know, uh, being out of that biology realm and having yes. the opportunity to take those two courses, that reinforced for me that I should be in a career where I have a lot of interaction with people, mm -hmm. um, tell stories, you know, be able to, to use my, my interpersonal skills to a greater degree than Absolutely. I probably would with biology. So well, that's interesting. So that was really a pivotal moment in your life when you had this discussion with him. Absolutely. Wow. And you, you got your degree, was it in 1992, from University of Kansas? Right. And then what were your next steps after receiving your degree? When I was graduating, um, I had an opportunity to join our admissions staff at the university right out of school. 
um, I had worked as a student in the Office of Admissions for four years, working reception, giving campus tours, uh, visiting with families, being the uh, the you know student example uh, when when you know parents were wondering what a what a typical Kansas student was like, mm -hmm. and I thoroughly enjoyed that. So upon graduation, I was offered a position by the director of admissions uh, to just take a break. The idea was to take a break and then move on to medical school. Um, one year turned into two years. I was going into my third year of recruiting for the University of Kansas when the Alumni Association uh, had a, a position open as their director of chapters, which are the alumni clubs around the nation. Um, I was encouraged to apply for that position, and when, uh, when I did, I didn't realize that I already had the job. Uh, they wanted me over there, mm -hmm. and um, and the position was something that that for a person just two and a half years out of school was a big step up, and I, I thought I had really you know, I'd really made it. Um, when I went over for my interview, I was interviewed by Dr. Fred B. Williams, and Dr. Williams had uh, three degrees from Indiana. He was a proud Hoosier. Um, in the interview. Again, he knew he was already hiring me, so he asked a couple of questions. He says, uh, "He says, do you ski?" <laughs> and I and I thought, well, that's an interesting question because um, you know I, I do ski, and he must be starting at the bottom of the resume and working his way up from like activities. <laughs> I said, "Yes, I do ski," and he goes, "Have you ever been to Zurich?" And I said, "Yeah, I was just through there the other day." He asked, "You were just through there the other day?" And I said, yeah, I was driving from Osborne, Kansas down to Russell, Kansas, and I had to go through Zurich. And he goes, I don't mean Zurich, Kansas, Zurich, Switzerland. And I said, no, sir, I've never even been out of the country. And uh, he says, well, you've got the job. You're going to Switzerland in six weeks with 63 alumni that want to ski the Alps. Wow. Again, I, I felt I had made it. But then that's how I got into the alumni business. People ask all the time, you know, what kind of major do you have to have to, to become an alumni director? Mm -hmm. Any kind of major. It's whether you have, you know, the desire to, one, exercise your interpersonal skills every day, and two, uh, take a job that's more of a lifestyle than a career. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So he still puts you through a little bit of the interview, knowing you yeah. have a job. Yeah, I think he was. I think he was. Uh, this is a, a, a contemporary term. I think he was punking me. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. <Yeah. laughs> well, so um, at some point, your your position at uh, the Kansas Alumni Association was was um, promoted yeah. to senior vice president. How did that transition occur? Again, uh, Dr. Williams walked into my office one day. He had just made a change uh, in the staff, a uh, pretty significant change. He, he said, well, congratulations, Mr. Cerny. You are now senior vice president, and you're managing all of your peers. <laughs> it, was a, uh, it was a shocking moment because um, I, re I didn't see it coming. And um, and was one of the uh, one of the steepest learning curves that I had because until then I was managing a program mm -hmm. and I had one support staff person and all of these friends scattered throughout the building. Um, in one fell swoop, I was suddenly uh, managing a staff that was responsible for all of our membership programs, all of our engagement, all of our student programs, other kinds of outreach, mm -hmm. and uh, everything except records, alumni records in the magazine mm -hmm. were under my purview. And I was the ripe old age of 28. So it was, it was a big change for me. I bet, quite a transition to go from peer relationships to supervisor relationships. Yeah, there are hundreds of books written on the topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, um, during your time as, as leader of the Alumni Association at Kansas, uh, you received your master's as well. I right? did. Correct. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how you pursue, began to pursue a career path in education? Well, it was, um, 
it was just about a year after I was on board at the Alumni Association. So I began at the Alumni Association in November of 1994. Um, I was encouraged by uh, a professor at uh, Kansas uh, by the name of Dr. Bailey in education to continue to pursue uh, you know, graduate work while mm -hmm. I was working full time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was evident that in the higher education environment, uh, graduate degrees were were um, uh, favored uh, in terms of upward mobility. I didn't know if I would be in the alumni business my entire career. Mm -hmm. um, would I get back into the university proper? Would I go a faculty route, administrative route, whatnot? So, um, encouraged uh, to to get a master's as a start, so I chose a master's in higher ed administration. And, um, and it was actually a lot of fun. Undergrad was, uh, to me, a bit of a bore. Mm -hmm. um, graduate work was great because um, you, were, you had a cohort of, of people, um, so you got to know folks very well. But in addition, um, you were able to apply what you were learning in class and what your experiential uh, efforts had been uh, to solve problems and um, to see higher education through a different you know, uh, prism. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very enlightening to me. I thought that graduate uh, work was going to be, again, a little, a little boring, a little milk toast, um, but it was anything but that. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed um, my graduate work. Dr. Marilyn Amy, who left the University of Kansas to go to Michigan State University's uh, higher ed uh, education program, was my advisor. and She was a tremendous help in, in my uh, success in graduate school. Uh, it's wonderful to have those good advisors who can kind of mentor you through your Absolutely. process. Well, um, I think beginning to transition, and, and I probably should have, have had you state for the record the year of your degree from your master's degree from Kansas. 1998. 1998, and that was in higher education administration, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, earned that while I was working full time. So I, know, I didn't, impressive. I wasn't exactly on the two year track, but I did get it done in three. So. Well, that's, I mean, that's an impressive thing to accomplish while you're working full time, definitely, especially in a high level position like that. Um, one of the things that I know you've been recognized for bring, is bringing technology and innovation to alumni associations and, uh, for example, receiving the Foreman Fellowship for Research in Alumni Programming. Uh, can you tell me about some of the ways that you've improved the alumni association, maybe starting at, at, at your job at Kansas? Yeah. Well, to, to the point, the day I arrived at the alumni association, again, this was November of 1994, mm -hmm. I walked in. To my office and I said to the HR VP, where's my computer? And she said, you don't need a computer, you've got a secretary. She has a computer. Wow. And at that time, they were still dictating letters. Directors were dictating letters. Yes. And I said, you know, I, I do appreciate having support staff, but yes. I've never dictated anything. <laughs> In the Office of Admissions, we had, um, you know, Mac classics that you had to boot up with a disk, but uh -huh. still you had your own word processor with a nine inch screen. That was still a light year ahead of where the Alumni Association was. I had a Smith Corona uh, typewriter, uh -huh. um, which got upgraded to an IBM Selectric something. And, and I encouraged the president of the Alumni Association to really look at computers for the professional staff and I received from uh, computer science a hand-me-down 386 computer but at least I had something. Right. Um, email was at the time through a dummy terminal that was uh, that was part of the server at the Endowment Association. We were really primitive and so I guess my first inclusion or or direction for technology was to say you know we're in an era now where there'll be an expectation that we're computer savvy and mm -hmm. you know that certainly has become the norm for for our business and and uh, uh, I'm glad that if 
if you call that an early adopter, I'm glad that I was an early adopter. Uh, our president, it wasn't much longer after that, he decided that he, he wanted a computer, um, but he wanted it to be more portable. So he asked me whether I would advise him on which lap dog he should get. And I said, sir, it's a laptop. It's a laptop computer, not a lap dog computer. That's great. So uh, off he went. And then after that, he was so proud to have the slimmest, you know, computer. You know, every time a new laptop came out that was thinner, newer, like the Sony Vizios or, oh, or yes. not Vizios, the Vios, when they would, when they would come out, he'd, he'd get rid of the old one, maybe hand it down to me, and then he'd get the latest one. So... So it sounds like you kind of um, started a, almost a cultural change in the organization where people, you know, who hadn't really been working with computers much really got excited about it yeah. and, and began really utilizing yeah. it. And then above and beyond that, you know, it was time to implement a web presence. Mm -hmm. You know, as those kinds of things came on in the late 90s, it was, it was absolutely important for our programs to be represented on the web. Um, for us to build, you know, email groups and, and other sorts of, of uh, technological outreach to both modernize our operation, but also do away with a lot of things that were very costly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had our own printing center in the alumni building. Um, you know, we were working with printed directories and all of these other sorts of things that could could easily be supplanted by an online resource. Of course. The, the two crossing paths of, you know, building your electronic presence and your member or, you know, users, uh, consumers' ability to, you know, have computers and use it, right. you know, you kind of had to, you kind of had to wade through that and do a little bit of each, but, um, but we drove alumni database uh, um, direction to more web-based uh, alumni uh, database offerings, um, certainly early adopters of web uh, for a web presence for alumni association, and most certainly high volume use of, of email mm -hmm. um, was was something that we were that we were after, and we were working in uncharted territory. And really, I was looking not only to what other alumni associations were doing, but you know what are the leading businesses doing. Yes. Um, with their with their electronic presence and and uh, electronic offerings that would keep their customers or their members close. That makes total sense. Well, um, kind of thinking about your transition from Kansas to University of Nebraska, you were recruited away from Kansas mm -hmm. to University of Nebraska and. How did that occur? How did you reach the decision to leave Kansas where you'd been for quite some time, not only in your position, but as a student as well? Well, it was a, it was a part of kind of a life's transition for me. Um, I had been encouraged to um, do more development work. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my mentors in the business had said that um, it's fine to have alumni underpinnings, but if one can have some fundraising experience, it's very helpful in overall university advancement. Yes. Um, that kind of experience will, will take you far. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Ed Paquette, who was the executive director of the Alumni Association at Nebraska, gave me an opportunity to um, not only run a membership program, which I had been doing at Kansas, but also start a campaign for the University of Nebraska Alumni Association. Oh, okay. So this was something that, that was um, very appealing to me. Mm -hmm. um, the salary bump was also very appealing to me. Um, Kansas couldn't keep me uh, for, the, for the salary. And, um, we, we, my wife Kelly and I embarked on an adventure to, to go to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And usually a campaign's about a five-year period. You know, we had thought that, that uh, maybe that might be our overall tenure at Nebraska, um, but that was, uh, that was cut short by uh, a call from Purdue mm -hmm. when they were looking for a new executive director. And the... Uh, the news 
to deliver to Ed Paquette, who had just brought me up, um, was going to be was going to be I felt very difficult. Um, I sat down with him and I said, Ed, you know, I've been here roughly eighteen months, and um, I've got a call from Purdue. Mm -hmm. Well, Ed, being a long-term veteran in alumni relations. Uh, and it's a very small family nationwide mm -hmm. of the leading alumni associations. He knew that Purdue was a top opportunity. So he, uh, he didn't even begrudgingly uh, encourage me to go. He, he said, you have a great opportunity. If you can land Purdue, then you should be there. That's and, and so it was, it was a tremendously wonderful understanding on, on his part given what we were trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. We still launched a campaign for Nebraska and we reorganized their membership program that you know to this day 2013 they still they still have implemented. Um, so source of pride there I guess uh, right. on a personal level but um, the the opportunity to come to Purdue was was an undeniably good one. Um, throughout my experience with the Council for Alumni Association Executive CAAE mm -hmm. and that Foreman Fellowship that I had that I had earned in the late 90s um, I had gotten to know the leading alumni directors in the nation CAAE is what I would refer to as the top 100 alumni associations nationwide okay so they're the who's who mm -hmm. of, of alumni associations Stanford Michigan Texas Kansas Purdue uh, you know, Penn State, you just kind of keep going on, North Carolina, Georgia Tech, Cal Berkeley, um, or it's, I'm sorry, it's either just Cal or it's Berkeley. Oh, I've I been see. taught, okay. but <laughs> Berkeley, it's a, um, you know, it's a, a great group of people. Well, I got to know Larry Prio, who at the time was the executive director of the Alumni Association at Purdue and knew a lot about Purdue. Um, I guess I should rewind and say that in my master's project, the thesis at the end of my uh, master's program, mm -hmm. I had written about the Purdue Alumni Association in the thesis and had interviewed Larry uh, in the 90s to uh, get an idea of you know, how we generated this Boilermaker loyalty. There was a very high degree of loyalty. Mm -hmm. If you looked at different metrics like degree holders who were members of the association or degree holders who were giving to the university, um, there was a high degree of participation at Purdue. So that's why I, that's why I wrote about that. Um, so there were several, uh, you know, um, beams of light kind of coming together into a, into a uh, bright point for me and Purdue. Um, having understood uh, the university having you know some connections and uh, you know with Larry uh, for example and knowing that it was a top job um, it was a it was a no-brainer to come and talk with the search committee did it did Larry have a role in recommending you to Purdue for the position he did he did not uh -huh. um, I didn't seek Larry's support mm -hmm. Um, there is there is a reason for that, and I'll, I'll just be blunt about it. Um, when Larry retired uh, from the position, uh, another gentleman had been hired and didn't work out. Uh, Larry had had uh, recommended or at least supported mm -hmm. this individual's candidacy. Mm -hmm. Um, that individual was here for about 18 months, so kind of a blip on the radar screen at Purdue. Um, and I knew that that had burned Larry a little. Sure. So um, I did not uh, reach out to Larry for a, a reference or a recommendation. I actually wrote him and told him that okay. I, I didn't intend to do that, and I didn't mean it as a slight in any way, shape, or form. It was just one of those things. I was not going to put him in that position with his alma mater. Um, I did not list uh, my two former bosses as well mm -hmm. because they had known the individual that was here in the interim too. Uh -huh. So I, I wanted to exclude them from that. So my, my references coming in uh, to Purdue were Gene Budig, the former chancellor of the University of Kansas, who was... Um, head of the college board in, uh, in Princeton and, um, and was the uh, former president of the American League of Baseball Clubs. 
Lauren Taylor from uh, the University of Illinois. He was a Kansas alum who has been the uh, president and CEO of the Illinois Alumni Association uh, for decades. And um, so an example of an outsider who can come in and, and run an alumni association as a non-alum, for example, they served as, as my two primary references. Um, I learned through the process they reached out to the entire universe that knew me. Um, they wanted to, to vet uh, my candidacy very carefully. And so, um, and so they talked with a lot of people, I understand, after, after the fact. But, um, but I didn't lean on Larry, yeah. and, uh, and I was very specific as to my reasons why. Well, that makes sense. You were trying to protect the, his, his position from having had that, that well, unfortunate... His relationship with his alma mater. Yeah. I mean, I know how yeah. important that is to people. Exactly. Well, that answered one of the questions I had, which was how aware were you of the Purdue Alumni Association before joining? And it sounds like you were very aware from having written your dissertation on that. Um, so thinking back to first joining Purdue about seven years ago now, what were some of your early goals for the association coming in? Well, my early goal, uh, my first goal, was to become part of the Boilermaker family. Mm -hmm. And um, I know how important it is, particularly for outsiders, to learn the culture and become part of the fabric of the institution mm -hmm. rather than to come in and try to change the institution to fit you. An impossible task. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you two quick stories that, that, uh, that uh, show the importance of, of that notion. The first is when Kelly and I came for our on-campus interview. I had an airport interview at O'Hare with the search committee, which was made up of board members of the Purdue Alumni Association Board of Directors. Um, past chairman, uh, chairman to be, and current chairman were were leading the charge. Um, then came to campus a couple of weeks later uh, to meet with the full board. When I was here to run the gauntlet, and I had courtesy interviews with Martin Jischke and Morgan Burke, and and um, Sally Mason was our provost at the time. I met with her. Um, met with a number of people on campus uh, that evening, which was a that was a Thursday. I went to dinner with Julie Riccardi and Reed Riccardi. Reed Riccardi was one of our fundraisers at okay. Purdue, and Julie Riccardi was the director of the Purdueettes. Okay. So as we're having dinner at a restaurant downtown, um, just the four of us, Kelly, Reed, Julie, and me, um, Julie asks, uh, do you know Hale Purdue? And I said, no, I, I don't know Hale Purdue. I knew that she was referring to the song. Okay. She says, you know what would really put you on over top tomorrow uh, would be if you would sing Hail Purdue at your interview. Wow. She asked, do you sing? Yeah, I do, Julie. I'm going to teach you Hail Purdue. Julie, it's 11 o'clock you know, <laughs> at night. My interview is at 8 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know that, that, I, can, that I can do that. Yeah. You know? um, and she wouldn't take no for an answer. Um, I guess any Purduette in her era would tell you so. And she dragged me out on the sidewalk and we went through the chorus of Hail Purdue three times. She asked, did you bring your laptop computer? I said, sure did. Go back to the hotel, fire it up. I'm going to send you the link to the All-American uh, Band website. And um, you can go through it with the All-American Marching Band and, and learn it. That way you can sing it tomorrow. Um, I agreed. but. Certainly at that time, I was not going to sing Hail Purdue at my interview. Right. So I did go back to the room. I listened to it about three dozen times and memorized the chorus of Hail Purdue. And then the next morning at 8 o'clock, I was in the boardroom with the 30 directors of the Alumni Association. And um, we had 20 minutes of presentation, pretty standard, mm -hmm. 20 minutes of Q&A, mm -hmm. and that was pretty standard. One thing that I noted throughout my presentation is all of my zingers, my one-liners, whatever, I couldn't elicit a smile or a laugh. It's like I wasn't getting through to people. They had on their interview, kind of their game face, yes. and I didn't feel like I was connecting. Um, but they were all just as nervous to be interviewing me as I was to be uh, interviewed by them. And, 
And um, at the very end, I just decided to go for broke. So I said to the president of the board, um, Rich Cruz, may I do one more thing? And he says, Mr. Cerny, the floor is yours. And I said, hail, hail to old Purdue. And people bolted up out of their seats. <laughs> They're and they're <laughs> smiling and clapping, and, and it was just, it was an amazing experience. That's and, and it totally changed the tenor of the interview. Um, after that was over with, Rich Cruz leans over to me and whispers in my ear, you realize that was a make it or break it thing. It was. That it was you just did. No. Oh. And I said, yes, I understand, he says, but it went over well. So as Kelly and I were leaving the room... Um, she was sitting in on my interview. It was definitely they were interviewing the both of us, right? Um, <laughs> you can't do that by federal law, but but uh, they f they figured a way. And um, as we were leaving the room, we had a receiving line. And then um, I'll remember that uh, by the time we got to the Indianapolis airport, and I was fueling my rental vehicle, my cell phone rang, and they offered me the job. My goodness. So it was, uh, it was instantaneous almost uh, to be hired on, and I was on cloud nine. Yeah. Again, one of the pinnacle jobs in the nation, and I don't say that just because I'm proud of Purdue. Mm -hmm. I say that because if you look at the strength of our association, the number of people that are involved in it, whether it's sheer members or whether it's participation by, by you know, the graduates, um, Purdue is a big deal. Yeah. It's always been a big deal. And, um, you know, it's served the institution since 1878. We've grown up in parallel with the institution to see her uh, prosper, see her people prosper. It's a really big thing. I had goosebumps the entire flight home, and uh, it was a great day. Do you know if they asked other people to come in for an interview? They did. They had three finalists. Uh -huh. um, two of us, you know, made the, uh, made the, the final, final cut. Um, but uh, I was told, you know, you both were good interviewees, mm -hmm. but it was the song. Amazing. Yeah. And so I guess my point was that one needs to adopt the culture. You need to become part of the culture. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I'll tell you just as a part of my history was um, being a Kansas grad, you know, you think you know your institution. You think you... you uh, you're the expert right. because you went to school there. I remember um, there was a new development colleague that had came on board and she went to the very vile University of Missouri. You realize that the Civil War started at Marseille <laughs> on the Kansas-Missouri border. Uh, it didn't start, you know, <laughs> okay. on the East Coast somewhere. The Civil War um, runs back into the history of these two warring states. Mm -hmm. And there has never been love lost between Kansas and Missouri. In fact, we call it misery. Uh, and so um, this young lady from University of Missouri came over to work in our development office, and I just had to rib her a little bit because sure. she's a tiger and, and whatnot. And, you know, it's more friendly these days. We don't burn down each other's towns like they did <laughs> in the 1800s. But um, one time at an event, she was up talking before the group, and she said, and since 1890, this is the way this has been done. I'm very proud of her. Well, afterward, I walked up to her and I said, just a little date check there, it was 1888. And she goes, no, Kirk, it was 1890. I said, hey, I went to school here. I know all about it. That thing happened in 1888. So I went back to my office, and, and uh, I pulled out a history book, and I was kind of going through it, and then I got to that page said 1890. I picked up the phone, I called her, and I said, you know, I chided you for the wrong date, but I was wrong. And, and she goes, well, th thank you for calling, and, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I had studied up because I knew it was important to become part of the Jayhawk culture, the University of Kansas mm -hmm. culture. Um, you can't just say you went to school here and suddenly be the expert on it kind of thing. I knew that in order to be accepted here, I'd have to know stuff up, down, and backward. Mm -hmm. And that was um, a very teachable moment for me to understand that 
it doesn't take an alum to run an alumni association. It takes about it takes someone who's passionate about learning about the institution, embracing the institution, its history, tradition, culture, and becoming a part of that. Yes. And you're far more effective that way. I tend to think that, um, and to all of the alums who are running their alumni associations out there, you know, I guess I apologize in advance, but I tend to think that alumni get somewhat lazy about their institution because they're part of it. It's a given, you know, they're, it's all good. Um, I think that, that that allows people to uh, be asleep at the switch or, or um, a little more lackadaisical in their approach to their work if they can take uh, their own institution for granted. Us outsiders, we don't. Right, right. You know you have to prove the, the loyalty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, um, when you came into the Alumni Association at Purdue, your, your title originally was Executive Director and CEO, correct? That was in 2006. Right. At what point did your title change to President and CEO? So that, that title, it's 2013 now, that title was changed uh, just about four years ago. Um, so throughout the history of the association, the first person that was officially an alumni director at mm -hmm. Purdue, which is kind of the generic term for this group, or the other AD, not the athletics director, but the alumni director. Uh -huh. um, it started out as the alumni secretary. And I'm the ninth such person at uh -huh. Purdue. So alumni secretary evolved into executive secretary. So for example, F. Baugh, who was mm -hmm. one of my predecessors, um, he, his title was Executive Secretary. When Joe Rudolph, who served the association for you know, nearly 50 years, um, when he was in the chair, the title was changed from Executive Secretary to Executive Director because that was, that was what was appropriate for the time. And then throughout Larry Perio's tenure and my predecessor, um, Executive Director was the title. Mm -hmm. We had... Um, you know, through kind of the, the, the changes of, um, you know, corporate titles and, and whatnot within, within uh, higher education, we had uh, some confusion about, you know, who the head person was of the Alumni Association. For example, the president of the Alumni Association was the volunteer leader of the board. Oh, wow. And so some of our alums felt like that person was the full-time leader, the CEO. Mm -hmm. And so um, we made a first step by adding executive director and CEO to the title of executive director. Um, that worked for a while, but we had, again, confusion institutionally as to what our people were, because I'm not a fan of gigantically long titles, but you know we would have almost like junior assistant associate directors, you know, yes. that as you went down through the, the, the filter of, of positions at the association. So um, rather than have all of that, I encouraged our board to think about changing our professional titles to be similar to our colleagues at the university, mm -hmm. not that I mm -hmm. find myself on the same level as the president of the university, but such that we're understood a little bit better with Absolutely. our colleagues and move our board to titles that reflect a contemporary corporate board structure. Mm -hmm. Having a chairman of the board, having vice chairman, having chairman for finance, mm -hmm. as you would see you know, in your shareholders report. Um, you know, so, and directors, so everyone knows what the board is and what their people are and they better understand what the staff is and and what our rules are and the hierarchy so some of it was it was just purely understanding and mechanics um, I honestly say it had nothing to do with ego um, had everything to do with common understanding mm -hmm. and that a lot of the leading alumni associations, particularly the 21 that are self-governing alumni associations like we are mm -hmm. uh, here at Purdue, they had moved beginning in the early 80s to mm -hmm. president and CEO mm -hmm. type titles. 
For example, I was hired by the president and CEO of the Kansas Alumni Association back in the 90s. He had been such since 1983. So um, most of our Big Ten colleagues, in particular the self-governing associations, which were at the time Ohio State, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois, they were all president and CEO. This was really aligning us with our peers. I bet. Absolutely. Okay, that's, that sounds good. Um, I noticed on your website that you have things like the Constitution for the Alumni Association, the bylaws, and so forth. Have those have there been changes that you've been involved with to some of those governing documents during your tenure? Yes. As a matter of fact, when I came on board, the board of directors was um, was full steam ahead changing the structure of the board. Okay. They were going to uh, create a much larger board that they felt would be more representative of all of the different colleges and all, all you know, dimensions of diversity and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I said, time out. Um, respectfully, uh, your governing board needs to be the, um, the arbiters of the direction of the organization, mm -hmm. not representative of every alum that we have, you know, on the face of the earth. That is impossible to do. And besides, we're a membership organization. Our members, they represent themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're free to, to uh, collaborate and join together in subgroups. And, you know, for example, the Purdue Black Alumni Organization, Purdue Latino Alumni Organization, our band and orchestras alumni organization are three great examples mm -hmm. of alumni groups that get together, and they may not be mutually exclusive. You know, the black alumni uh, uh, that are part of the band sure. alumni organization, for example. So all that being said, I said, what the board of directors really needs to be is a tightly woven board that understands uh, that it must uphold the mission of the association, the solvency of the association, and the, the future prosperity of the organization. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take 50 people to do that. Right. Um, at the time I was hired, the board was 30. Uh, the board now, through restructuring, um, has a maximum of 29 members. Mm -hmm. uh, it can have far less uh, members. Um, we currently have 28. We have five positions that are at large, okay. um, whereas the entire board previously had been elected by members. These five at-large positions are elected by members of the board of directors rather than the members. Mm -hmm. Now, we protected the members' right to majority of the board. The board mm -hmm. can never have more appointed members, which includes the officers, the four officers of our board, than it does member-elected directors. Mm -hmm. So the members always have the upper hand if they're, right. say, you know, if there's a, a desire for the voice of a member um, in any in any you know proceeding, but those five uh, at large positions gave the board some flexibility to address academic diversity, you know, ethnic diversity, to address um, skills diversity needs that the board may have. You know, it's always good to have a good parliamentarian. It's always good to have an attorney on the board. It's always yes. good to have some of these skill sets that may not come through an elective process. So to answer the question, yes, we did a lot of changing to the bylaws and our rules and procedures. The Articles of Incorporation, which are basically the constitution of the association, those don't change and shouldn't change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, those have been uh, on record with the state. We were, we were founded as a corporation under the 1921 uh, Corporation Act of the state of Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we were, and we were an organization. You know, a society of alumni, if you will, uh, all the way back to 1878, founded by the first four graduates of Purdue. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for the time period between the 1870s and really um, the the early 1900s, you know, 1911, mm -hmm. 12 is when we started publishing, you know, the alumnus and, and so forth. It was during that time that we kind of formalized ourselves and then actually sought corporate status in the state of Indiana, uh, 
you know, not not long after that. We um, we have uh, you know in our in our bylaws and rules and procedures, uh, we have the mechanisms to to uh, run the organization and and to fairly represent the voice of alumni. Uh, at the institution, we've done a lot of work on those documents over the last, you know, seven years, and they were doing work on them before I got there. We have decided, as a board and as a leadership team on our staff, to kind of put a stop to reviewing mm -hmm. documents. Mm -hmm. Boards can focus inward so easily because that's what you know, that's what you're comfortable with, and you know, procedure and all these other kinds of things. Um, can consume a board's activity. Um, we have encouraged uh, uh, contemporarily our board to focus its effort outward, mm -hmm. to engage the colleges and schools at a higher level, uh, to um, represent the association externally uh, more than more than they do today. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a great challenge. It's also a learning curve for our board members. Um, who you know are being encouraged to be evangelists for the organization rather yes. than just you know governors. Yes, so kind of an ambassador type role right. that they play. Um, how would you say other other than um, you know some of the things we've talked about, with such as the title change and so forth? How would you say that your position has changed over the last seven years? Well, first of all. Um, this is my this is my first CEO role. Mm -hmm. I had always been a doer. I had always been the person that was asked to do something and deliver a product. Right. Yeah. Um, this is this is for my career my first foray into being the visioneer. You know mm -hmm. the, the the person who is to see uh, the big picture and to line up all of the uh, the appropriate pieces to deliver that vision. Um, so that's been um, that's perhaps been the the biggest challenge to start, I guess. And then thinking back on your question of you know what were the what were some of the early goals? Well, the early goals were to um, you know first take a full inventory of what we were doing as an organization mm -hmm. and weed the garden. If we had some things that were holdovers that didn't make sense or weren't serving alumni in the right way or weren't the best use of our resources, we needed to mm -hmm. to, to figure that out and, and slim down a little bit. I've always been a, a proponent of s simplicity. Um, you know, we can become really complex really quickly and have massive uh, amounts of programs that, that really do very little to attract people to be involved with the university, mm -hmm. if we if we have key programs that that deliver you know high impact, we should really focus on those things and leave the rest alone. The Purdue Alumnus Magazine is a great example. Mm -hmm. You know, when we survey our members, you know, what are the greatest benefits of membership? Like eighty seven percent say, I, I'm a member because I'm loyal and I like to read the magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's evident that if the alumni association were to do nothing more than produce a magazine, mm -hmm. we would have a following, right? right? A loyal right. following. Right. Um, to that point, when we survey our members and ask them, you know, what's the number one reason that you're a, that you're a member of the alumni association? It's loyalty. Mm -hmm. It's not the discount at the bookstore. It's not the you know the fact that we you know send out flyers for club events in your area. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with heartstrings being gold and black pumping through your veins uh, kind of thing. That's that's what really turns people on and, and why they're involved. At least that's what they ter tell us you know, when we survey them. And we do member surveys every year, so we kind of get a, a pulse of what our alums are thinking. Um, so take an inventory. We did that. Uh, we found that we needed to change some programs just a little bit, uh, refine uh, the way we did our engagement, refine our membership program, uh, went through that with a fine tooth comb, added a level called the Loyal Boilermaker, which is like an annual membership that's just a step up mm -hmm. in terms of a cost. And, and, you know, there are a lot of people who are willing to do a little more just sheerly out of loyalty. But um, another thing that, that was an initial goal is to elevate the reason mm -hmm. 
for being an active alum in the life of the university or being an active friend in the life mm -hmm. of the university. Um, we're really good at alumni associations of telling you about all the stuff. You know, it's almost a, a, a analogy I like to use is um, we've got this garage that uh, has this red truck in it. And the red truck is, we keep it pristine. It's clean as can be. Mm -hmm. Keep it really clean. And it's got these hoses in the back that are all lined up just really great because we need to pull those hoses out when we get to where we're going. And, and um, did I tell you about the boots? The boots, we line them up right next to the, to the red truck. And that's so we can jump in the boots. And then that's after we've come down the brass pole from the second floor. We get down from the second floor on the brass pole, we get in the boots, we get in the shiny red truck, and we roar off to where we go and we pull the hoses out. Uh -huh. When what you really need to tell people is that we rescue people from burning buildings. Uh -huh. That's the big thing. So at the Alumni Association, we're great about telling you about the discount at the bookstore, and you're going to get the club flyer, and you're going to get six issues of the magazine, and it's going to make you feel really good. But what we really do as alumni is we support an institution that serves humankind mm -hmm. and society and makes it all better, just a little bit better, you mm -hmm. know? So... The betterment of humankind and society is what this institution is founded to do. And you, as her alumni, are responsible for seeing this institution prosper so that we can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing. And if I were selling you a membership today and I expressed that to you rather than the 10% off at the, at the bookstore, that's going to sell you over the 10% of the bookstore. Yeah. And so we needed to change philosophically what we were selling in terms of your involvement with the institution. And you can see it. You can look at the way people give to the institution. They give to a, a college that they feel is making a societal impact. They give to a scholarship program that's going to directly impact a student and their ability to attend Purdue. Mm -hmm. You know, these higher uh, callings for an institution and its people. That's what our alumni are rallied to do through our organization. So we need to shift the needle from doing stuff to really serving a higher purpose. Well, it, it really ties in well, I think, with another question I had about when you mentioned loyalty at Purdue and the, the slogan, loyalty lives here. I, yeah. I love that. And I wanted to know how that came about and, and what are some of the ways that you cultivate loyalty? Okay, well, the, the very first piece of this is um, in, in moving the needle, mm -hmm. we also needed to brand the association. And I'm not talking about coming up with a fancy new logo. Right. We needed to look at the association, look at our mission. You know, is our mission today the same as it was in 1878? Mm -hmm. Is our mission today the same as it was 50 years ago? Um, we had to ask some of these questions of ourselves and establish that, yes, our mission is still on target, which, if you boil it down, is to see Purdue and her people prosper. That's what it is. I mean, it's, you know, to support the university and to support interaction between alums and foster, you know, good feelings about the institution. But I like to say it's to see Purdue and people prosper, her people prosper. It's easier. So we defined that the mission was correct mm -hmm. through our branding process. Then we added um, uh, a, a, a purpose statement. You know, uh, your Purdue Alumni Association is the gateway for loyal alumni and friends to build relationships with each other in the university. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so that is kind of our internal statement of you know what it is that we do, right? You know, we're, there are keywords in there: gateway, loyal alumni and friends. Um, relationships; um, those are the those are the things that that we focus on um, uh, in in terms of our overall business. We then established um, through not only talking with our staff and with our board, but through focus groups with alumni and, and friends and non non alum friends that. Uh, uh, you know, may have gone to school here but didn't graduate, um, member, non-member, 
these focus groups, we, we, we talked about, you know, you know, key words that, that people think about when they think about their university or when they think about their alumni organization or whatnot. And that drove the, um, the development of what became nine brand values of our organization. Um, the first one, and they're in no particular order, but there's nine, is make work fun. You know, we're going to come in as a staff and as a board and enthusiastically pull on the door every day and we're going to work hard, we're going to play hard, we're going to be the kinds of people that are that are fun to be around mm -hmm. because that's the people that you want to associate yourself with, you know, those people, not the non-fun people mm -hmm. kind of thing. So there were other examples of, you know, achieve win-win partnerships. Um, we're going to look for partnerships on campus, partnerships in the community, partnerships with groups of alums to, you know, create winning opportunities for Purdue. Um, we're going to respond with integ integrity. We're going to be a world-class organization. You know, we're not just an alumni association. We want to be one of those companies that people want to work for, yeah. you know. One of my goals, long term, I want to be on that Wall Street Journal top 100 small companies to work for. Because we, we meet all the criteria. We're smaller than 50 people on staff and, yeah. and so forth. Wouldn't that be cool to have the Purdue Alumni Association? There's been a few not-for-profits on that list, but so that would be really cool. So but to be world-class, world-class people, world-class um, volunteers, very professional, integrity-driven, you know. So we established these values. And so, um, you know, part of it, was yes, we needed to rebrand the association so so we would be more visible to our constituency and visible throughout the university. But we needed to get our internal workings and underpinnings set first. Mm -hmm. And so that was the revisit of the mission, which stayed the same, a, a brand promise statement, uh, and then our our uh, brand values, which we live every day. There's a firm in Indianapolis called Adiana, which was actually founded by two Purdue alums, and they were our uh, consultants, if you will, and they, they did their work pro bono for us uh, oh, nice. during the branding process. But, you know, they, they've branded Country Mark, for example, mm -hmm. you know, the co-op uh, mm -hmm. here in, in the state, and they did a brilliant uh, rebranding of Country Mark in uh, early 2007, and we emulated a little bit of this, um, for example, and... and they continue to this day to rave about how we established the brand and we live it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one of those things like a strategic plan where you've written something and it collects dust. Yes. We actually live this, this, uh, this plan um, and brand. And so you can see it on my chest today. Um, my rule of thumb for the, for the fellows in the office is you can be coat and tie or you can wear the brand. Mm -hmm. Your choice. You can be in a polo if you've got the brand on. Mm -hmm. So people That's opt nice people <laughs> opt to wear to wear the brand. But it's it's about establishing, you know, in everyday life, uh, the Purdue Alumni Association. We say Purdue Alumni, which means both the people and the organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe a decade down the line when, you know, somebody says Purdue Alumni, they know they're talking about not only the people, but that organization over there. Well, it took Nike a long time, you know, for just do it to represent Nike. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are there are, you know, examples of over time a brand being established such that, you know, it becomes a, a household or a common term. Yes. Um so, you know, Google it. Right. <laughs> um <clears throat> so I guess I'll stop there and let you go on. Okay. I just um wanted to make sure do you need to do you need to head out before 10? Because if you do, I can, I, we, can, we might want to schedule a second. Oh, you mean before 11? Uh, before 11, sorry. Um, no, let's, let's keep sure. rolling. Okay, yeah. great. Um, what would you say, in a nutshell, are the most critical responsibilities for the leader of an alumni association? One has to... Um, one has to fairly represent the voice of alumni mm -hmm. um, and it covers a vast waterfront of perspectives on the institution, um, of experiences with the institution. I mean, you know, our organization is comprised today of people 
we have a couple who still graduated in the 1930s all the way up to people who graduated last year. I mean, it's you you, you have to you have to be skilled at representing a lot of constituencies. And we don't have to represent them. It's not like I march over to Hovde Hall and say the alumni are doing this, or the alumni say this, or think this, and the young, young ones think that, and the old ones think this. It's not that bold. It's just that, that there is, uh, there's, there's skill in, um, in being able to deliver appropriately that voice for the institution. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, when you ask, well, who are the voices of the institution? Well, it's the faculty, clearly, university senate or whatever. Uh, it's the students, the university government, uh, and you got the administration. There are your three voices. Mm-hmm. They forget that there's an alumni voice. Mm-hmm. You know, in American higher education, the voice of alumni or the care and concern of alumni, especially in public institutions, has provided more than the state alone can provide. And there's no arguing in a private setting that alumni voice is critical. A, none of these institutions would be what they are today without, you know, concerted alumni support. So that's the first thing. Um, Got to be a diplomat, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because you do, you know, walk a lot of, of, of fine lines. So you got to be able to tap dance a little bit, but a, a, a high degree of diplomacy is required. Um, but you're, one day you're an educator, you're teaching about the organization, one day you're a marketer, you're trying to sell the organization, another day you're the diplomat, you know, or a politician, uh, another day you're the MC, you know, or the, the leading the three-ring circus, you know, when you're doing a pep rally or a ball or something like that. It's a, it's a, a very diverse set of skills that one needs to bring to the, to the, uh, to the table. Um, but like I said at the beginning of the interview, I'd have it no other way. I'd be bored without uh, a change of scenery every day. And there's no doubt that there are very little, very few two days that are the same. Yeah, it does keep things interesting, definitely. Well, would you talk briefly about any challenges you faced in the position here? Probably the greatest challenge uh, early on was being an outsider. Mm-hmm. Um, there is both a strong culture of of Purdue family and friends at this institution that can be somewhat insular. Yes. I'm not saying that it's war- that it's not warm and welcoming. Mm-hmm. Um, once you're part of the Boilermaker family, or you establish yourself as a Boilermaker, that's why I said it's important to come in and try to be a Boilermaker. Mm-hmm. Once you establish, you're welcomed with open arms. And um, to this day, there are people that ask, wow, you sung Hill Purdue at your interview, when were you in the Glee Club? I mean, it's just like, that's the, that's the natural progression of thought. Right. Um, but it was, being, it was being an outsider. And it, I don't put myself in the league of the following individuals, but I do remind people from time to time, particularly when somebody's giving me a hard time, and some people are sophomoric enough to give me a hard time about not being a Boilermaker, um, I remind them, you know, Red Mackey wasn't a Boilermaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, Martin Jischke wasn't a Boilermaker. Uh, Beering? No, not a Boilermaker. That's even, Um, not a U angle. (laughs) I mean, you you, you just, you know, you, you can, you can rattle off names. Uh-huh. Uh, even Mitch isn't a Boilermaker, but he'll tell you he is. Right. You know, right. so, um, you know, there have been a lot of great leaders. And one of the things that are, that are Boilermakers now that weren't originally. Um, and one of the things that I find really ironic about the higher education environment in that respect is, for example, for faculty, you try to reach beyond and bring the best people yes. from everywhere else in, right. and you're you're somewhat tainted if you're a three degrees from one person and serve that inst or three degrees from one place and serve that institution beyond. Right. You know, it's like you got to leave the nest and come back, or you know, all of the higher ed jargon. And um, 
it's the complete opposite with alumni director. Mm -hmm. they, they say, well, don't you have to be an alum to run the Alumni Association? Well, the Alumni Association, I mentioned that we're one of the 21 self-governing alumni associations in the nation. We're a separate corporation from the university. Mm -hmm. We're an affiliate of the university. Um, you know, the president of the university can't fire me. He can suggest to my board that I get fired, mm -hmm. and probably would, but, um, but it's not a direct line. It is an affiliate or an auxiliary relationship with the institution. Well, these, these, these 21 alumni associations, they are um, they're big businesses. Uh -huh. You know, we're, to date, we're about a $4 million a year operation. Um, we're responsible for funding ourselves. You know, we mm -hmm. take nothing from the university, nothing from the faculty or support of the students or tax dollars or anything. Mm -hmm. We pull on our boots by our bootstraps. And um, it takes a certain set of skill uh, in a, in a not-for-profit setting to run that successfully. Mm -hmm. That's my job, and that's what I'm good at. And so um, that is, uh, that's, that's, that's primarily why I was chosen for the job. But the biggest challenge you know, from the outset was just being a non-alum. That's no longer a challenge. The challenge today is um, really engaging people in an era when traditional lines of engagement are no longer necessary. And you know where I'm going with this. I mean, you don't have to send out a magazine for people to know what's happening at Purdue. Mm -hmm. They can read the local newspaper, you know, online from Seattle, Washington. They can uh, watch basketball games or football games online from Hong Kong. I've done that. Um, they can be involved in the information flow from the institution in very different ways uh, than, they, than they used to when they would wait for their alumni magazine to come in the mailbox. Mm -hmm. um, interaction with each other. People ask all the time, you know, what, what's happened to the reunion culture? Well, with the advent of Facebook and all of the other social media, you're never out of touch. Yeah. You don't have to get together with people physically in order to keep up with them. Mm -hmm. Reunions used to be one of those things where you'd return every few years and catch up. Right. Uh, now, students that are graduating, and there's an example just the other day of a person who uh, graduated, got her first job down in Memphis, and um, she doesn't even feel like she's unplugged from, from campus mm -hmm. because she's still in touch with her friends here who are still in school, and she's in touch with her friends who have flown to the you know four corners of the of the earth yeah. with their new employment prospects. So um, the, the whole business has changed. And therefore, if you go back to the implementation of technology, we've got to be using LinkedIn and Facebook and all of these other social media um, uh, apparatuses, apparati, I don't know what to do. Not good at English. <laughs> um, we, we have to be utilizing all of these mechanisms in order to reach out and keep people engaged. And where it's happening in, in this you know, particular uh, frame of time, um, LinkedIn seems to be the direction that people are going professionally. Mm -hmm. And I think that they've got a, they've got a tremendous uh, corner on the market in terms of uh, the place where college graduates and professionals put their their vita, if you will, yeah. and and uh, represent themselves and their relationship with an institution. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, LinkedIn may not be here ten years from now, or it may evolve into something totally different. But today, um, that's an example of how we keep people linked together. That's totally different from from before, but. Staying on top of all of that just kind of makes your head spin. Oh, you know? I imagine. And you had talked about um, you know representing such a broad spectrum of alumni and the, the technological divide that must be present for the different age groups and the, the expectations for how they receive and hear information. Yeah, you know, there's there's a there's a I, I think there's a conventional wisdom that older alums won't be online. Um, that is false. Uh, they are as wired as as younger people. Um, I would, won't say as wired as the people who are graduating today. We all walk around with three devices. We've got a nice. we've got an iPhone, an iPad, and a you know a, a Mac laptop kind of thing mm -hmm. all in one bag. Like we need all that, but um, they still they still do interact online and are doing so in in greater 
in greater uh, in greater number all the time. Mm -hmm. So, well, did you were there things when you came to Purdue that struck you as unique in terms of the alumni compared to other places that you had worked in that kind of environment? Well, actually, I'll compare them favorably with other places that I've worked. It's a it's a very unique moniker that we have. You know, to become a boilermaker, there are no other boilermakers anywhere. Yes. To become a corn husker at Nebraska, to become a Jayhawk at Kansas, there aren't other corn huskers and Jayhawks, mm -hmm. just like there aren't other boilermakers. So it's very similar that there is kind of a unique moniker, there's a unique identity, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think that this, you know, do I have anything empirically that, that drives, you know, my thought on this? No, not really, unless you look at, again, our engagement of degree holders. But a unique moniker creates a unique culture. And um, that, is, that is powerful for engagement. Because, you know, if, if you're just one of the zillions of John Smiths out there, you know, it's not as powerful as having a unique moniker and so that that's a that's a big thing and that's similar to the history that I've had too so mm -hmm. being able to talk about that and, and serve that is is a little bit um, more uh, uh, easy for for me um, with respect to the institution very different um, this institution knows what it is knows what it wants and how to achieve it you know, engineering here just blows my mind. At other institutions, you know, even great universities, engineering will be in one building. All the departments will be in one building. Mm -hmm. Here, departments may have multiple buildings, and there's, they could be an entire campus yeah. of, of purely engineering. Same goes with ag. Same goes with, you know, a lot of our academic disciplines. Um, you know, computer science used to be in a, a department that would be scuttled in the back of one academic building at Purdue. It's multiple, you know, yeah. uh, buildings reach. And so, um, you know, this is something that is, that is uh, truly unique. And I know that it's, you know, it's uh, contemporary practice to talk about STEM or STEAM with mm -hmm. agriculture in the middle of it, science, technology, engineering, ma ag agriculture, and mathematics. But that is what Purdue is, is all about at its core. Um, you know, I don't dismiss management. I don't dismiss the College of Liberal Arts. I don't miss educa dismiss education or pharmacy or any of these others. You look at any of these uh, colleges at the institution, they all have their, you know, amazing uh, rankings and points of pride and, and everything else. So um, Purdue's very well-rounded. But as it goes with other institutions, you know, we know what we're after and what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And we take great pride in not only educating, but the things that we come up with, we deliver on on the, on the back end. And Purdue people love that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, and so that, that makes us really unique compared to other universities. That's interesting. How, do you, how does the Alumni Association engage with current students? We have a program called the Purdue Alumni Student Experience, which, you know, we love acronyms at universities, so that's called PACE. Yes. And this organization was started a little over seven years ago, and it came out of a student ambassadors group that, that we had had at the association um, for, like, event and ambassadors and ambassadors mm -hmm. to alumni clubs and whatnot. And uh, we created a student membership program, almost like an alumni in training program for our students. And PACE has now grown to uh, 4,200 members on campus, mostly undergraduate, um, some graduate, however, we're expanding that to our international student population as well that are here, and they're very eager to be a part of it. Um, PACE can be as passive or active as you want it to be. Mm -hmm. Some folks are just members because their parents think it's a great deal. And I talked about discounted at a bookstore not being such a big deal. PACE students actually get 10% off their books at Follett's, which, you know, if you're talking about a $25 a year membership and, and, your, and your book bill is $500 or $800 or, yeah. you know, whatever it can be these days, um, uh, they earn that, you know, money back and more on their membership. So there, there is a little bit of a hook with the student membership that, that helps. But moreover, as these students then go through the college experience and they have more touches with the Alumni Association and, and opportunities with alumni, we do you know, alumni networking events where they get to 
you know, meet and, and, and mingle with, with uh, you know, movers and shaker uh, type oh, alumni, nice. um, you know, those kinds of things. Those are uh, students that are on the back end showing twice the propensity to join the Alumni Association after they graduate, twice the propensity to give a gift to the institution after they graduate. And so, um, you know, we keep at it, we keep growing that base. You know, you might say, geez, you know, 4,200, that's just barely over 10% of the student population at Purdue. It's better than zero. And we have a lot of, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of, you know, alumni in training, which we're very proud of. And so that's what we're doing to engage people uh, while they're here. With the international students, particularly, we're engaging our uh, international student organizations because um, these organizations, they're, they're, they're very tightly knit while they're here. And then they're also very tightly tied to their alumni and friends in country. So it's a perfect conduit for us to be able to reach our alumni in other countries. So in, in a lot of cases, our student groups here will help us identify where our alums are overseas. Um, you know, no, that guy didn't go back to Singapore where he's from. He's in London now. You know, building the network uh, has been great. Plus then, their loyalty to this institution is, um, again, I don't have anything empirically that can show this, but their loyalty seems to be even greater than a domestic student because a lot of their institutions where they come from, their undergrad institution or whatever, they don't, they don't have alumni programs like we do. They don't engender the relationship with the institution like we do. It's more of a transactional relationship that they have with their, uh, with their in-country institutions. So when they come to a place that embraces them, it's magic, yeah. and they want to have this lifelong relationship with the university. So we we work the international student groups as well. That was, and that also answered another question I had just about international alumni um, engagement that you do with the clubs and so forth. Yeah, um, outside of the country. So well, it's a it's a big piece of our business because you know for a very very long time running, Purdue's had you know an amazing uh, international student population, yes. and so. Um, you know, we we don't do international work because it's it's sexy. Uh, we do it because it's necessary for the institution. Um, you know, when you consider right now that the one out of six students on this campus, you know, are mm -hmm. international, it's uh, it's important for us to focus on it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I have just a couple more questions for you, Kurt. Um, what is the thing that you're most proud of achieving during your tenure so far at Purdue? It has to be um, the establishment of the brand for the association to heighten the visibility of the organization. And um, I've always said that our alumni database is kind of like an electronic Rolodex. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might as well just have a Rolodex yeah. um, because it it doesn't do what we what we need it to do for effective um, understanding of our graduates uh, and of course effective marketing of our organization so um, in the last couple of years we've uh, we've implemented a customer relationship management system uh, CRM that allows us to more deeply know individuals and also they can uh, you know graduates and friends can um, interact with their account, if you will, like you would with Southwest Airlines or Marriott Hotels or whatever online. So your experience is 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 much better and much more um, uh, well. Excuse me, meets the expectations, uh, the contemporary expectations of our of our members and and customers, if you will. So those two items in particular have been huge game changers for our business. One final question, what do you see as the next big thing for the Alumni Association in terms of your vision for where you'd like to be maybe say five years from now? So, you know, we, uh, you know, folk, folks will say, uh, you know, you've got 15, 16 percent of your degree holders who are members of the association. You know, is, is that world class? Is that, you know, middle of the road? Where is it? Well, it's pretty good. Yeah. But we have to find ways that engage larger audiences of our alumni with Purdue mm -hmm. um, that that move alumni engagement to a to a higher level, you know, to the highest gear possible. Um, a lot of alumni 
it's conventional wisdom to think that we're only reaching out because we would like them to write a check. But we need alumni to be advocates for us in the state, you know, with the General Assembly and whatnot, to continue to support higher education in the state of Indiana. We need them to be advisors to, to even more thoroughly bring together theory, theory and practice. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, Purdue's really good at making stuff. We're good at, you know, coming up with ideas and then delivering something through the marketplace. This is where alumni can have, you know, enormous impact whether it's venture funding or whether it's bringing their corporation to bear, you know, on on uh, technology or, or uh, innovation. So, you know, the being an advisor part uh, of, of the role is, is key, and we need as many alums uh, involved in that as possible. And then obviously the recruitment end. Um, you know, alumni serve as our greatest ambassadors for the institution in terms of bringing in the next generation of the very best students we can attract. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so engagement of a greater group of alums is more than just engagement of a greater group of people who can write checks. It's, it's multifaceted. And um, you know, over the course of the next five years, I would like to see our percentage of, of engagement of our degree holders go up. Um, but moreover, we may have to look at, at, at ways beyond membership that allow that to happen. And um, so uh, I have suggested uh, quite, quite strongly in, in a meeting tomorrow morning, November 1st, with Mitch Daniels, we're going to be talking about um, a culture of philanthropy, which philanthropy, you know, is, again, in the era of mega campaigns for universities, it's come to mean old people who can write checks. Mm. It really means love of humanity. That's what philanthropy is. Um, we need to create a culture on campus whereby um, people know about and want to serve that higher calling that I talked about earlier. You know, that Purdue, you know, they say, you know, we, we, we you know, move the world forward kind of thing. Purdue directly impacts humankind and society. You know, kind of thing. We need to move our our message there, which I, I, that culture of philanthropy, love for humankind, is is what we are ultimately all supporting. And I think that'll bring more alumni to uh, to the fore for the institution. Certainly, generate more interest uh, of alumni if they feel they're joining that cause. Yes, absolutely. Well, is there anything that you wish I had asked that you'd like to to say as part of your interview today? Well, I think I've said a lot. <laughs> um, it's, it's a tremendous source of pride um, to be a part of the Boilermaker family. Um, it's been a life-changing experience for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> seven years into it now, uh, with the transition of administrations at the university, if you kind of look around the cabinet table, if you will, mm -hmm. I'm one of the more senior people. I didn't expect that. Right. You know, didn't expect that to be the case. You look around now... Alyssa Rollick, VP for Ethics, mm -hmm. Morgan Burke, our Athletics Director, um, Pam Horn, our Dean of Admissions, uh, Vic Lechtenberg, you know, who's, who's our you know, former Dean of Ag and VP for Engagement and Provost a couple of times. Right. <laughs> who knows all the things. If you, if you take those four people, I'm like fifth on the list in terms of seniority, which is wild to me. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's an honor to serve, and, and uh, I really love this place. Uh, we've become uh, Boilermakers, and we've become a, uh, firmly a, a part of the community. So. Well, and I, I think that shows. I think, I think that people definitely see it that way. So. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for interviewing with me today. I really appreciate Certainly. that. Certainly. Thank you.